to Royal River. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, as the last speaker of the school, it's a uh, particular honor and pleasure to express my deepest appreciation to the organizers. So thank you so much, Jorgas uh, and Volker, for setting up this awesome meeting. really feel the energy in the air. I think it's uh, really a success and a uh, fantastic uh, game for the field that, uh, yeah, whose impact we will feel over the next years, if not decades. All right, uh, so let's come to the last part of the string theory lecture. Let me briefly remind you of uh, salient points of the last lecture. We were discussing closed string tree-level amplitudes, and uh, there was factorization all over the place. Well, step number one, let's look at the integrands, which factorize on the nodes. We are supposed to compute correlation functions on the sphere for closed string vertex operators, and uh, they effectively factorize these vertex operators into chiral halves of the uh, open string flavor, one uh, producing uh, big contractions of anti-holomorphic type, one of them producing big contractions of holomorphic type, and uh, yeah, essentially, uh, the big contractions uh, between barred and unbarred quantities are zero. So therefore, you just compute the open string correlator separately and insert it here. Good. Step two is, uh, does the factorization carry over to the integrals? After uh, doing these integrals of a functions in a sphere, which may potentially uh, cut the Cobain-Nielsen factors coming from here and there. And at the integral level, uh, factorization holds a slightly uh, weaker form. Factorization only holds modular phases. And uh, here is a very uh, concrete manifestation of this modular phase. Here in the fourth point level, we went in detail for the derivation of the Kawaii and Tai formula, which uh, gives us the four point function of type 2b superstrings in terms of projects of color order trees of uh, open superstrings. And here are the uh, promised phases which uh, come from the monotony factors uh, if you deform the contours in the way that we discussed. Now, one of the many benefits of uh, having this KLT formula is we can study its alpha prime to zero limit and learn about a new feature of perturbative gravity. So, at alpha prime to zero, this uh, should better reduce to the 4.3 level amplitude of supergravity. And uh, on the right hand side, the alpha prime to zero limit takes us to a bilinear in color order the angular streets. So that's something you would uh, probably not expect by staring at the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian, which encodes the um, three level S matrix of perturbative gravity. And uh, if you want to go beyond alpha prime to zero, uh, well, the zeta corrections can again be uh, organized in terms of the gamma functions. And I'm not sure whether I find the time to highlight the general pattern, but let me state for your amusement that there are only odd zeta values here when uh, you take the effect of the sine function into account. I mean, in the open string case, you also saw uh, even zeta values, and uh, those are gone. Okay, so here this thing in blue is uh, the KLT formula in field theory for supergravity. Uh, And here in the line below are all the string corrections. I mean, this guy starts with 1 plus alpha prime q. Now, the uh, first thing I want to introduce now is uh, the higher multiplicity version of this uh, KLT formula. And uh, there is no new idea to tell you about. When it comes to KLT at endpoints, it's just a combinatorial challenge. But uh, all the contour manipulations that you have seen before, they just go through and need to be iterated. So uh, let me say quite respectlessly, it's uh, the same complex analysis. Uh, but the only difference is that it's more combinatorial. Okay, uh, let me uh, give you an idea of this extra combinatorial layer by writing down the endpoint <coughs> version of KLT. So now, 
it's a sum over various permutations of uh, some of the external legs. So here, uh, Greek letters stand for permutations of those legs that are enclosed in the brackets. So this is a permutation row acting on a total of n minus 3 enclosed legs. So here, S n minus 3 refers to the permutation. And uh, now I'm supposed to also give you a couple of uh, right moving um, open superstring trees. And in general, there is something like a matrix structure that tells you how to correlate the permutations on the left and on the right. And uh, you see it already in the four-point example. Um, it's beneficial to not uh, use the same color kind of orderings on the left and on the right. There's this twist of leg three and four upstairs, and there's a similar twist you can do to those two legs. You don't have to, but it's good for the um, collection of sign functions that go along with it. So what we have here, this object S alpha, is just the endpoint generalization of this uh, sign function over here. So this is a big matrix. Since it is indexed by permutations rho and tau, the size of this matrix is n minus 3 factorial times n minus 3 factorial. And all the entries have in common, all the entries are supposed to catch the phases and generalize the sign functions, which we have already seen in the four point context. So uh, the entries go schematically like each entry has n minus 3 factors of um, sign functions and in general the sign function will have yeah, some combination of minus sign variants in the argument. And uh, I hope I was sprinkling the alpha primes correctly such that it's in fact of degree n minus 3 in these combinations. So when alpha prime goes to 0 you just pick up the corresponding k or k behave smooth and alpha prime to zero. Yeah, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, the four-point case is uh, just up uh, there. And if you're surprised about the notation, why I'm noting down here one, it's just to remind of the basis choice that uh, we kept leg number one always in the same position. If you don't see that these are bases, don't worry. I will give you a detailed account of that in 10 minutes. OK, uh, so this was, uh, these were some words about the S alpha. Uh, let me now tell you about the scope of this formula. We were only using the analytic properties of the Kobanielsen factor in order to get there. And the Kobanielsen factor is, if you wish, universal to the bosonic theory and the supersymmetric theory. So therefore, there's no harm in gluing together open bosonic strings with themselves, or even mixing open bosonic strings and open superstrings. Which means uh, there's also a version of the KLT formula where instead of type 2, I can get uh, closed bosonic strings if uh, we combine open bosonic strings with more open bosonic strings. Just do the replacements here and simultaneously there. And uh, there's also a heterotic string theory, which is, if you wish, a hybrid of a superstring and a bosonic string. And there, you also have uh, gravitational amplitudes from the sphere, where you can do the integral by factorization into A super times A boson. So it's a really universal trick, this KLT contour deformation. That's why uh, the structure is not sensitive to which specific theories you apply it to. If you're sufficiently careful about what you mean by SIJ, you can even go ahead and apply to tachyons or to massive excitations. 
yeah, uh, the spoiler was already there. If you want to see a five-point example of this KLT matrix, it then becomes two by two. Since the permutations rho and tau act only in the legs two and three, then typical entries uh, look like that, and uh, the other two can be obtained by relabeling. And uh, what you can also uh, see from here, the next uh, step is to uh, look at the field theory limit. As alpha prime goes to zero, we will have uh, Yang Mills amplitudes on both sides. The only difference between bosonic strings and uh, super strings is uh, whether you land in pure Yang Mills or super Yang Mills with fermionic completion. Do the uh, alpha prime to zero corollary, or if you wish, the field theory KLT formula. And as I stressed before, uh, this really has a big uh, scope. It's telling us that at the perturbative uh, level, at, at least at tree level, our gravity stems from a double copy of uh, gauge theory building blocks. And uh, yeah, the formula for the supergravity trees, which is induced by the string theory formula, it's obviously um, copy pasting the combinatorics and just putting super young Mills trees in place of the open superstring trees. Okay, as you see, I'm even too lazy to spell out legs 2, 3, dot, 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 all the way to n minus 2. So the rule is always, whenever there are some legs that you don't see, this means that they are hidden in the permutation model. Okay, and now in the uh, field theory flavor of uh, KLT, we are trading the S alpha prime for a simpler KLT matrix S0. And here, all the sign functions are just brutally replaced by their uh, arguments. So you just do the alpha prime to zero limit at uh, the level of each uh, sign function. And uh, here you see um, the five-point example of how this field theory KRT matrix looks like. Yeah, so on the right-hand side we have a really uh, nice formula, double copies of gauge theory building blocks, and um, a zero in the middle. And there's again an important uh, remark about the pole structure. So it's not a typo that n and n minus one change positions, but instead this is good for having as many poles as possible from the color order Jan Mills amplitude. I mean, in the end, this, should, this gravity amplitude should have all the cubic diagrams, in all channels. So it's beneficial to get the poles from here, whereas this one is local in that basis choice. You're not forced to use a local representation. You can also rewrite the guys here, but then you will get some of the poles from here. And anyway, the job of all these Mandel sum invariants is to cancel the overshooting poles, namely those pole channels which are contained both here and there. So you may, have uh, you may have situations where it's a total of n minus 3 inverse propagators appear and that they really need to cancel overshooting poles. Good, this is the remark about the right-hand side. And let me just elaborate a little bit on what the left-hand side stands for. The left-hand side is the answer to a question that you are normally told to never pose. I mean, it's uh, the answer to the question, what do you get if you apply Feynman rules to the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian? What happens if you expand this Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian around flat minkowski background? What if you insert, instead of the metric, what if you insert Minkowski plus small fluctuation? I mean, the graviton is actually the small fluctuation of your metric around Minkowski. 
H is the spin 2 field. And uh, yeah, if you just blindly follow this uh, kind of QFT, a Feynman rule prescription, you would get a nightmare out of the einstein hilbert Lagrangian. You would get some kinetic term. Okay, there's a certain sensitivity to your gauge fixing. Take the Dombo gauge, for instance. And then there is really a hell of a lot of stuff at any order in the gravity field. I mean, there's an inverse metric hidden in the Ricci scalar. There is a square root of the determinant, which is also an all-order series in the graviton field. So this is much worse than in Young Mills. It's, uh, oops, it's really a never-ending uh, tower of uh, higher and higher powers in the graviton field. And it's not only frustrating that uh, this set of final rules never terminates. Also, each individual order is uh, having more terms than you want to process. So already the cubic vertex would have 171 terms. Already this quartic vertex would have oops, something like this uh, number of terms. I think uh, there's a famous Bryce DeWitt uh, article which went through working out these details in a specific uh, gauge choice. But for sure, it's much preferable to compute these perturbative gravity amplitudes from another copy form. So this is the practical side. But more important is the conceptual uh, message that there's something about gravity that we can understand in gauge theory terms. And maybe this is the even bigger motivation to push this program of gravity being gauge theory square to higher loop order and to maybe trace it back to some kinematic algebra. Excuse me, when you say 171 terms, you mean some particle in the fixed or in the it's about the way you contract the Lorentz indices. I mean, there are three powers of h for the total of six Lorentz indices, and there are two derivatives. So there's really a lot of things you can do with that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So that uh, concludes the endpoint KLT formula. Oh yeah. That's a question. Output is zero um, is there some kind of review valve for shared background? Oh, yeah, I think this is a hot topic of uh, current research. I think the Ambitwister friends in uh, Oxford had some uh, results on this, how uh, double copy extend to, to curved space time. Let me refer you to recent papers of uh, Mason, Casali, Adamo, and maybe similar author configurations. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone right now. <laughs> Just ask me if uh, these, but these names don't lead you to where you wanted to get to. Okay, so this uh, was a statement about gravity in the closed string, but there is also a nice corollary for the open string in Young Mills. A corollary which is almost too obvious to be mentioned at all. This is about <coughs> monogamy and uh, BCJ relations, which will be properties of open string and gauge theory amplitudes, respectively. So let me remind you of this uh, place in the proof of KLT, where we got this um, contribution to the Z-bar integral, where we had a non-contractible contour where we had a contour of this type. And uh, I was asking you to deform that contour to wind around the branch point at the origin. I was recommending you to do whoops, this one with a C minus and C plus contours and so on. And this uh, was the setup which uh, led to sine pi S12 times super string 3 amplitude in the ordering 1, 2, 4, 3. Okay, in the blackboard we had a, the bar version of it, but let's, let's not mind about that. So, maybe some of you would have preferred to close the contour in the other direction. I mean, we can also pull over this piece here and uh, wrap it around the branch point at z, z equal 1. Sorry, z bar equal to 1. So this is the other alternative, which is equally valid.
So maybe some of you would have preferred the calculation, which leads to a different looking answer. So this time, uh, it is the part of the Kobanitsen factor that goes like this, which uh, drives the monogamy. So with this contour deformation, you would get instead so let's see, now z bar is uh, left of a 1. So this is a different uh, color ordering. This is, if I'm not mistaken, 1, 3, 2, 4. Okay, this looks mysterious. There are two different expressions, different looking expressions, but it should be the same gravitational quantity. Well, the only way out is these guys are actually equal. So it looks like open string amplitudes in different color orderings just differ by a ratio of sine functions. So this is the first instance of the so-called monotony relations, which allow you to reduce all your color orderings for open strings to a basis of n minus 3 factorial. So here it's a one-dimensional basis, n minus 3 factorial at n equal 4. So let me spell out the endpoint uh, version of that. I mean, if you were to do these contour deformations in the endpoint KRT formula, then you can run a similar argument that different contours can be close to the left or to the right. And uh, accordingly, by running similar arguments, to land on what is uh, known as the monotony relations. And the original references for that are oops, this. Okay, let me write down, um, say, the elementary version of monotony relations. I mean, once you have such a relation here, you can, of course, freely relabel exchange 2 and 3 and so on. For sure, you can generate many other relations by just permuting. And uh, at endpoints, you get already a spanning set of monogamy relations if you relabel the following thing. So it's always a matter of uh, combining sign functions with different arguments. And now, the tree of the, the color ordering of the open superstring tree, it has leg number one sandwiched into various positions. So if you take a careful look here at the side functions, there's always a K1 involved in each term. So the idea is to do some uh, contour deformation in the Z1 way. And accordingly, leg number one will be inserted into various uh, places between uh, j and j plus 1. So note this correlation between the color ordering here and the specific argument of the sine function. OK, again, one can take the alpha prime to 0 corollary along the way. And these relations where you get to, after taking alpha prime to zero, they have been uh, first defined by Bernd Carrasco and Johansson. These are the BCJ relations. And uh, the explicit form, well, you just do the same replacements as before. Whenever you see a sine function, replace it by its arguments. And uh, whenever you see a super young Mills tree, sorry, an open super string tree, you replace it by super young Mills. And uh, the way how Bernke Asko Johansson arrived at these relations, um, this is the paper where they came up with the duality between color and kinematics which is the more general concept that is also robust under loop-level generalizations. So they were explaining that these relations 
are a consequence of color kinematics duality, that they are a manifestly gauge invariant incarnation. Yeah, probably you won't have the time to give an account right here on the wonderful scope of the color kinematics duality. It's uh, roughly speaking an exchange symmetry between the color factors in a gauge theory amplitude and the kinematic dependence of epsilons, k's, and also loop momenta. And there's overlapping evidence that there's an all loop uh, truth to this kind of color kinematics duality. But in this exchange picture between color and kinematics, the focus is on locality. Uh, the focus is on cubic graphs that could arise from uh, final rules. But here, you have everything in gauge invariant packages. There's the usual tension between locality and gauge invariants. So here, this is the reformulation in terms of gauge invariant quantities. And uh, on the other hand, you can't see on the first glance how the cubic diagram content of the different terms works out. Okay, so here the key reference is uh, that paper here, which really changed the field. Hmm. Okay, and uh, yeah, the uh, universal uh, remark to both the string theory and the field theory incarnation is by studying permutations of the equations on the blackboard, you get in both cases an n minus 3 factorial basis of independent uh, color orderings. So, no matter if you are after a string theory answer or field theory answer. A valid basis choice is, for instance, holding three legs fixed and then permuting uh, n minus three of them in any uh, way you like. So here, row is a permutation of n minus three legs. That's why the number of terms in your basis is n minus three factorial. Okay, and the last side remark. These relations in string theory are again just the consequences, the consequence of the Kovalevsky factors, monotony, monotony properties. So it doesn't matter if you do it for the super string or for the open bosonic string. So accordingly, the monotony relations hold in both string, string theories and their respective field theory limit. Okay, uh, uh, very last uh, comment is uh, there's again an understanding in terms of intersection theory of all of these statements here. So, um, already the KLT matrix S alpha prime, which is uh, no longer on the black blackboard, S alpha prime is filled with intersection numbers. Or more precisely, it's the inverse of S alpha prime that can be understood as intersection numbers between twisted cycles. So this is not only intersection numbers of open string integration cycles, but it's also uh, about loading these cycles with a branch choice for the Coburn-Nielsen factor. So intersection theory here just means keep track of how cycles intersect and how the phases of the Coburn-Nielsen factor uh, play out. And uh, here are these monotony relations for open string amplitudes. This is just a statement that in the uh, space of twisted cycles, you can pick an n minus 3 factorial basis. So in the end, it's really uh, doing linear algebra in this uh, vector space of uh, linearly independent uh, twisted cycles. And I will give you the co-cycle part of the story in the next uh, chapter. Before I transition to co-cycles, are there any questions right here? Uh, 
Um, okay, so in the first place, there are uh, disc ordering or the inequalities between the punctures and the boundary. But it's also about a branch choice for these uh, multi valued functions that you have all over the place. I mean, I was writing down the open string amplitudes with absolute values, but for any color ordering, you can drop the absolute values by putting the i and j in the correct order. So this is an important uh, defining property of a twisted cycle. Yeah, so the right reference is uh, 1706 and uh, 1710 or 11 papers of uh, Misera. It's uh, a really uh, nice piece of work translating uh, math into physics and uh, giving a very good uh, picture of, the, of what happens. <clears throat> okay, so the next part is uh, a double copy structure. of the open superstring. This might uh, look a little bit surprising. We just uh, discussed the double copy, pro copy properties of the closed string. So shouldn't the open string be more the input rather than the output of a double copy? But I'll convince you that there are also KLT formula that describe the uh, open string tree level amplitudes. Uh, I think uh, the slickest way of uh, carrying out the discussion is to first introduce some sort of uh, atom of an open string amplitude. Uh, to introduce, say, a universal paradigm for the moduli space integrals that you can find. So once the notation is uh, there, then one can uh, make the statements more easily. So the most uh, general kind of integral that you might be faced, uh, facing in an open string field calculation is of the type that you integrate over punctures on a disk boundary in a given ordering. And here the first entry in that notation, it refers to the integration domain. But now, what could we possibly uh, integrate Okay, for sure there's uh, the SL2 fixing involved, which already appears outside the general formula for the three amplitudes. And now, let me give you a particularly representative example of what, of what the correlator can give you. Oh yeah, recall that uh, Zij is always a difference. So a very typical integrand is a cycle of Zi minus Zi plus 1 at the difference of neighboring Zs. So this may remind you of the part taylor formula in Johannes Hens lecture, and indeed the jargon is to call these guys part taylor factors, even though they are not uh, literally uh, momentum spinners. And now here I correlate the cyclic ordering of the part taylor factor to the integration domain, but I wouldn't have to do that. In principle, there can be any permutation of the integral, and it's still fun to integrate an object over the very same order. Such an integral with uncorrelated slots will generically appear in a tree-level amplitude calculation. Yeah, so the second entry in this notation up here, it refers to the order of that uh, part taylor denominator. Okay, so let me uh, first of all uh, show how some of the relations on the previous blackboard carry over to these guys. 
the monotony relations for the open string, they don't really care about the kinematic factors. They don't care at all what you do to the polarization vectors, how you contract them into momenta or other polarization vectors. All of this contributes at most a rational function, which doesn't affect the monotony properties of the Kovalevsky vector. So therefore, monotony relations on the nose apply to these uh, z integrals here. Okay, so this is just a recapitulation of the monotony relations just written at the level of the object where they really matter. This is again a combinatorial game of inserting leg number one in various uh, positions. And uh, the second entry doesn't matter at all. So you can do this for any part Taylor ordering row. Okay, so when holding the second entry fixed, there's an n-3 factorial collection of uh, integration cycles. So it's tempting to ask, uh, what is the analogous relation if I keep the first entry fixed? If we integrate over one and the same cycle, but now play with different part taylor factors. And here is the claim. In the second entry, these z integrals satisfy BCJ relations. So all of a sudden, all these sine functions are degraded to just their argument. But nevertheless, this is a relation that uh, is claimed to be exact in alpha prime. I mean, all of these z integrals, you saw their first point, the four-point example, there they are gamma functions of the Mandelstam's, otherwise they are infinite series in alpha prime. And, um, Big object is claimed to satisfy BCJ relations with alpha prime independent coefficients. And again, the idea is to keep one of the entries fixed while varying the other. The integration domain is claimed to not matter here. Okay, the proof for that uh, claim might be a flashback of uh, Claude's lecture. It's a matter of integration by parts. So, um, let me give a five-point example, which probably gives you a good idea how the proof can go in uh, full generality. Let's do a five-point example in the usual frame where the last function is going to infinity. Good. Uh, let's look at a typical expression at five points. Suppose we have fixed three punctures to zero, one, and infinity. Then you may study a total derivative in the five-point function over over Nielsen factor and maybe some inverse factors, z, which you got in some OPE. Now, in that frame, z5 to infinity, the Kobanitsen factor stops at i and j equal to 4. You won't find z5 anymore, since it's sitting at infinity. Um, derivative is quite easy to evaluate. You can ignore the absolute value of the Kobanitsen factor. Everything that the Z3 derivative does it is producing um, is producing some inverse powers of Z3 minus uh, some other function. And of course I will get the Mandelstam variables from the Kobanielsen exponent. Okay, sorry, they're symmetric. Good. But now, 
For each of these terms, there's a unique SL2 covariant uplift. All of them stem from some z integral in a particular gauge space. And uh, yeah, by SL2 covariance, this, uh, this unfixing is unique. So these, uh, this expression here can be rewritten in terms of uh, the following combination of z integrals. Admittedly, here z3 is the dynamical leg, which appears in all the money sum invariants. So to really match it with a relation spelled out above, you might need to relabel it a little bit. Z3 going to Z1, please forgive me for that. But yeah, this example illustrates the key idea how integration by parts can be used to land in a, to, to generate relations between Z integrals and to ultimately arrive at n minus 3 factorial basis, also with respect to the choice of part Taylor. So, to connect with the clothes lecture, here, uh, this just means we have computed the dimension of the twisted cohomology, where the twist refers to the cobalt Nielsen factor that introduces these Mandelstam dependent terms into all the total derivatives that you may wish to study. Uh, by the way, uh, the, the physics community it was uh, for a while just a speculation or conjecture whether one can always go to this basis. But in fact, as I recently learned from Sebastian, it uh, follows from work in the 80s done in mathematics by Al Boto, who essentially identified n minus 3 factorial as the Euler characteristic of n0n, the relevant moduli space. So just to say that it's proven in mathematics. Okay, so um, there are these nice relations for the z-integrals on both the side of the integration domain and on the side of the integrand. And in both cases, we can uh, cut it down to an n-3 uh, factorial basis. Now, let's see what the amplitude does when squeezing all the z-dependence into part Taylor form and when uh, furthermore reducing the part Taylor factors to a basis. start by writing down the obvious part and then uh, I make a pause before stating the non-trivial result. Okay, from our motor's result about the n minus 3 factorial, it is clear that you will be able to write a color ordered endpoint amplitude of the open superstring in the following form. There's first of all an integration domain, this can be any permutation pi, and of course the z integrals will respect that integration domain. That's pretty obvious by definition. And now, uh, by reducing to a basis, it is always possible by our motto to arrange the part Taylor factors into this n minus 3 factorial basis. But now, what is the coefficient of here? Well, you get what you get, just grab the correlator and reduce it to that basis, and it turns out the coefficient of that basis integral is maximally nice if you insert uh, this one. I mean, this is an invertible matrix. It's still always possible to combine with this one. But the reward for building up this uh, second line is, now, the leftover thing on the nose of ECJ basis of super young Mills. So this is the non-trivial part. I mean, once you reduce all the integrals to a basis, all you can say is that you'll get some gauge invariant function of the polarizations. But maybe there are a lot of possible gauge invariants out there. Which specific gauge invariant function is it? And uh, 
Yeah, the nice result is it is in fact a T kernel times a BCJ basis of super young Mills trees. So this was uh, firstly computed within the pure spinner formalism and uh, then cast into the language of these uh, Z integrals. So it's the second reference where the KLT structure was firstly spelled out. Yeah, so in this form, all of a sudden, the open superstring became uh, isomorphic to a KLT form. I mean, just imagine you were to replace this Z here for a second copy of A super young Mills. Then this would be nothing but a supergravity form. So it seems like this uh, paradigm of the KLT kernel is pretty generic. You can combine the KLT kernel with any doublet of BCJ satisfying things. Remember, BCJ relations were introduced as some sort of a consistency condition of a KLT formula. So whatever I present you next to a KLT kernel, it should better satisfy uh, BCJ relations. Otherwise, we would have a problem with permutation variance. But uh, Given that um, IBPs generate these BCJ relations, it's perfectly all right to put the second entry of Z into such a KLT form. And just to make contact with something you have seen uh, way earlier on, this uh, object Z4 point, which was all over the place in the first lecture, it's just a specific representative of these Z integrals. Yeah, this can be recovered from here. Okay, yeah, so the uh, takeaway message here is that for the endpoint function of the open superstring at free level, you find uh, the same KLT formula as uh, you've seen before in uh, supergravity. And let me furthermore emphasize in the very first KLT formula that you have seen, there was an S alpha prime with sine functions of uh, Mandelstam invariants. But here, this is the field theory version where no trigonometry is allowed. It's just uh, homogeneously uh, linear in, in uh, K dot case. I mean, you see here from the way how the ECJ relations are derived. When we take total derivatives of the Kobanielsen factor, we don't pick up sine functions. We just pick up these uh, Kobanielsen uh, exponents here. That's why it's an S0, not an S alpha prime. Okay, so we have seen before this KLT matrix S0 is a symptom of a double copy. You saw an S0, uh, the same context as you saw the double copy statement that this tree level supergravity is uh, the square of super young nodes. So it's tempting to think about a similar double copy paradigm to view at least from the tree level perspective, to view the open superstring as a double copy of super young mills times something else. And here, this refers to some theory which produces the disk integrals as its amplitudes. I mean, this is just running the following kind of argument. Whenever there's a KLT formula, shouldn't there be a physical theory interpretation for both sides of it? Okay, and one option for the next bullet point is to give you some evidence that such a theory, such an interpretation might make sense. Now, when did we start? 15, 20 minutes. Ah, huh, okay. <laughs> so now there are two options what to do with these 15 or 20 minutes. I could give you some evidence that there are some field theories already in the Z integrals. Or, alternatively, I can do some math and tell you a little bit about uh, the alpha prime expansion of the endpoint integrals, tell you about the uh, multi zetas about co-actions, and uh, so I think both of these things we can do within 15 or 20 minutes. So who wants to uh, see more field theory structures? Oh, yes. Ah, you were asking what about bosonic? Yeah. Ah, very good. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, so, again, you'll always be able 
to bring it in the form where the second line is inert. This is just linear algebra. But you don't have control over what you get here. And in fact, um, you can still interpret uh, the first line for the bosonic string as a gauge theory tree amplitude, but it's a more unusual gauge theory. Um, here, this is about a gauge theory known as the F square plus Jan Mills, which was introduced by Nolan and Johansson. They were initially after conformal supergravity. They were initially after a KLT formula for conformal supergravity amplitudes. This was the birth of the, the F square theory. And they also pointed out that you can couple it to Young Mills and you can preserve BCJ relations by coupling the F square to Young Mills. So here is another BCJ satisfying object which has the right to appear in the KLT formula. And uh, there are a lot of further consistency arguments that this should be at endpoints the coefficient of the open bosonic string. So the analogous double copy statement would be that the open bosonic string is the same kind of z integrals, but this time you replace super young hills by the f square plus young hills. You can read about that in uh, this paper here. Does this uh, make sense? There was another question. When you originally find the z integral on top x, should that be the super SO2 oscillator in the volume? Oh, no, no. Um, the super part of SO2 R is already gone. Okay. Um, you can fix it by first of all putting the inverse Ci minus Cj that you have seen before. And then it's just a matter of which vertex operators you use, the minus one picture or E0. What they both have in common that they produce uh, yeah. Inverse powers of Cij through the OPEs. Yeah. There's no, no more memory of the super part. It's just reflecting the fact that at low loop orders in RNS, you can first integrate out the fermionic moduli and then recover bosonic modular space integrals. Yeah. If you just at some point, if you just the idea of the problem of this thing was sort of super against means in the lower energy unit, so. But now it seems that actually it's going to be super young meters times something. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be not very easy. Okay, so to tell you the truth, uh, when computing it in the brute force manner, we didn't really put any uh, uh, assumption. We just computed the correlator, and we had a representation of 10-dimensional super young Mills amplitudes, which we could identify in the CFT calculation. But uh, now, in order to see that uh, this formula is consistent in alpha prime to zero, in order to check that afterwards, you need to convince yourself that this one, the z integrals, become the inverse of S0 and the leading order in alpha prime. Yeah. Right, so these guys are essentially... Uh, okay, you need to go in a specific uh, n-3 factorial by n-3 factorial basis to make it invertible. But in a suitable basis choice, this becomes the inverse of that. Okay, then let's probably do the majority vote. Math versus field theory structure. Who wants to see math? Okay. Uh, who wants to see field theory structures? It looks like slightly less. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, just contact me after the lecture if you want to hear about the field theory structures. Let me now conclude with some remarks on the alpha prime corrections. I hope that this gives some more connections to the uh, previous lecture, particular to the one uh, by Claude. Okay. So then this is a 
about the number theory connections. And uh, okay, I think all I can do is uh, the open superstring and the knees. So you have seen that the alpha prime expansion of the four point function introduces uh, Riemann zetas. But this is an accident at four points. At higher multiplicity, you'll be uh, facing multi argument generalizations of the zeta values. So let me give the definition for them. I think. Uh, Claude managed to get around defining them. So this is uh, behind the acronym MZB. So I hope that this time I'll get the case and the ends at the right place. So uh, in the same way as Riemann zeta is defined by a single infinite sum, you can now do a nested sum over several integers k, subject to these inequalities. And now for each summation variable, you can choose an independent exponent. And these are now the arguments of the multiple zeta value. And uh, let's better make sure that the last one is two or larger to uh, get a convergence on OK, and the uh, coordinates of uh, this multi zeta is uh, the weight on one side. It's tempting to call it a transcendental weight, but as you heard from Claude, we don't even know about the transcendentality of zeta 3. But nevertheless, there's tons of evidence that there is a gradient by weight. That all the relations among MZVs with Q coefficients preserve the weight. And then the number of arguments is called the depth, and this is not a conserved quantity, this is just a filtration. There are many relations where double zetas can be expressed in terms of single zetas. And I think in most cases, whenever you can reduce the depth by applying relations, you should do that. OK, so uh, having defined these guys, then uh, let me tell you some general statement about the alpha prime expansion of the z integrals. And once you know how the z integrals alpha prime expand, you also know how open superstring trees and bosonic string trees expand in alpha prime. OK, in case of the bosonic string, you get some more alpha primes from the df squared plus the Mills theory. But the z integrals are really the uh, only source of MZVs. OK, so the alpha prime expansion of the z integrals. It's very good that there was this question before. Their field theory limit is something like the inverse of KLT. So uh, in terms of mass dimension, this guy here is uh, as if you have the propagators of a cubic vertex final diagram. So this is the leading alpha prime order. And I think here you see why I inserted this funny two alpha prime uh, numerator into the definition of C. So this is the field theory limit. But now, the alpha prime expansion goes as follows. And please understand all of these statements in terms of dimension counting. I don't want to commit to the details of uh, the polynomial structure. So, no matter at which multiplicity you are, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the power in SIJs and the weight of the MZVs. So this is uh, what you heard about as uh, maximum transcendentality or uniform transcendentality. So to the extent that you accept weight to be a gradient, the alpha prime expansion of the endpoint Z integrals is uniformly transcendental. So here I'm just writing a generic Q linear combination of MZVs of weight K. So the big uh, takeaway statement is that the alpha prime expansion is uniformly transcendental. And uh, okay, there are possibly many ways how to, to prove that. And, uh, one possibility to find a slick proof of a uniform transcendentality, it's not necessarily the first one, but you can grab 
uh, this paper that I had with uh, Johannes Brödel, Stefan Stieberger, and Tomo Hiele Terra Sommer, where we generate these alpha prime expansions recursively from n minus 1 points up to n points. And in each recursive step, you get uh, the so-called Grittfeld associator, which is a generator generating series of multiple zeta values. And this, these recursions will manifest that the number of alpha primes is always in one-to-one -one balance with the transcendental weight. So it will follow from the uniform transcendentality of the Grittfeld associator, whose matrix representations are spelled out here. OK, so this is the first info I wanted to give you about the alpha prime expansion. But let me now refine a little bit. How many of these uh, NZB coefficients are independent? I mean, at higher weight, they are both products of zeta values and single zetas. I mean, at weight 8, you have, for instance, this and that and that and uh, that. The basis with respect to Q grows with the weight. And to the best of our knowledge, there's a four-dimensional Q basis of weight 8. And the last thing I want to tell you is how many of their coefficients are actually independent? How much new information is there? And how many of them can you derive by other means? Let me now give you a formula which computes uh, three of them in terms of simpler building blocks. Um, so the bottom line is all you need to know is what the coefficients of the Riemann zeta values are. So once you know at each weight what's the coefficient of the primitive, then I will give you a formula to infer what's the coefficient of a product zeta m times zeta m. Or likewise, at weight 8 is the first time you get an irreducible double zeta. And also there, you can express its coefficient solely in terms of the coefficients of the primitive. So this is just a representative for other higher depth uh, zetas. <coughs> and uh, the key to relate these uh, coefficients is uh, the co-action. So Claude was telling you there's a co-action even for the uh, bigger objects, for the uh, Gonchakov polylox G. And in particular, this co-action formula induces a co-action on the zetas. I think Claude, Claude showed you the formula. The co-action of the odd zetas is zeta tensor 1 plus 1 tensor zeta. And for the even zeta values, we must be more careful. The even zetas only appear the first entry, because the second one is defined modulo one over these. OK, so the reason why I want to have this formula after doing KOT is this is another instance of the KRT matrix. So here we do the usual sum of the permutations alpha and beta. There's the same KRT problem, which you have seen a dozen times. And now the coaction for each disk integral can be expressed in terms of further disk integrals. So the first entry, we preserve the integration of that's in lines with what Claude told you. The first entry knows about the monodromies. So the monodromies are the job of the integration. But the integrand in the first entry, well, this is more agnostic. This doesn't affect the monodromy. Now, what's the job of the second entry? Does anyone remember? What does the second entry of the coaction do? Which operation is it sensitive to? Derivative, precisely. And the derivatives are encoded in the integrands, in the choice of Park Taylor integral. So I should better make sure that um, the integrand of our starting point is appearing as the integrand in the second slot. And uh, filling out the integration domain here is just a matter of completing the K of T formula. It's just the usual combinatorial game we have seen all the time in the previous KLT formula. OK, so you can view this KLT formula as a resolution of identity. We have just inserted a complete basis of uh, basis cycles 
no, sorry, basis forms and the dual cycles. And uh, this KRT matrix takes care of the relative normalization, divides by the corresponding intersection numbers. Okay, and uh, let me stress, this works as a KRT formula because the second entry only, um, is only modulo um, pi square. So you might be worried that this one doesn't satisfy the CJ relations, but after this module, uh, it does obey the CJ relations. Okay, the very last thing I'll say is one example of uh, using that formula. If you really want to know what the coefficient of that double zeta value is, you should just look at the situation where you insert zeta 3,5 from both sides. So here, in order to determine its coefficient, you need to know its co-action, which goes like and here the non-trivial term of the co-action is that there's a term zeta 3 tensor zeta 5 with a funny rational number. So this is what you need as an input in order to determine the coefficient of zeta 3 comma 5 from the formula. Just make sure you grab the part on the right hand side where you have these uh, zetas, the left and right of the tensor. Good, so yeah, this uh, probably brings me to the end. Uh, time is running out. There are for sure a lot of further things to be said. I could be talking about the uh, closed string upper prime expansions, which have a lot of further surprises. And my apologies that I didn't even touch upon the, the loop level discussion. There's also a lot of things to say about loop amplitudes and string theory. Yeah, I hope this was a digestible introduction, and uh, yeah, just let me know if you have further questions. that I shamefully neglected. Uh, this is a paper thing here. Uh, cannot be found away. Ah, here. Yeah. story uh, down here. These are two papers. This one and that one. Zetas descend from uh, polylogs, from uh, the G polylogs that you saw in Claude's lecture, and the Gs are by themselves multivalued. But you can always find a single value completion by combining them with their complex conjugates until all the monodromies are gone, and then by evaluating single valued polylogs, you get single valued zeta values. And this is how you can get the closed string at tree level. Now, at genus 1, there's a similar story. They are elliptic analogs of multiple zeta values that come from integrating out the open string punctures. And these are, again, multivalued functions, elliptic polynomials. And you need to make them single-valued. And the new quality at loop level is also modular transformations are part of the discussion whether an expression is single-valued or not. So among other things, you want to make sure that the modular behavior is acceptable. 
So at one loop, you're obliged to combine elliptic polylogs with their complex conjugates in a way such that they become modular forms. And uh, in both cases, your guiding principle is to preserve the holomorphic differentials by, uh, when you go up in, in weight. That's uh, this formalism of single-valued integration by Schnetz and Brown and uh, Dupont. So it is kind of preserved like this very long range of process, or a loop value, taking care of the modular definition. Yeah. 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 Okay, so at the, on the one hand, you want to preserve the holomorphic differential, which determines you the, say, left-moving part. But then you are uh, putting in uh, right-moving quantities, complex conjugate elliptic polylogs, and those have to be tailored to give a good modular behavior. Okay. Since we are messing in time, uh, as proposal we close. So I think you're going to be here for a few more minutes, or? Absolutely. So to answer question in the foyer, because I thought we Anyway, so uh, let's thank Oliver again for this beautiful set of lectures.